Greetings, Earth Scientist, and welcome back for Coral Reefs. I don't know if you've been diving, but I've spent quite a bit of time uh, scuba diving and can tell you that the world beneath the waters is remarkable. It's once you get started there, you're like, wow, it's so incredible. You want to learn more and be able to see more of that. So we need to learn about how coral reefs operate, what their importance is for humans, and what humans can do to help protect coral reefs. Corals need a few things to operate properly. First and foremost, they need calcium carbonate, CaCO3. That would be a great test question. They also need a way to seam, uh, for the process of cementation to occur, and that calcite and calcium carbonate allow that to happen. They also need sediment and nutrients and the ability to photosynthesize in order to properly operate. Coral reefs are truly the superstars of the ocean. They exist in very specific water conditions. There is such a thing as a really, really deep water coral that doesn't photosynthesize instead of it uses chemicals near deep sea vents. We're talking about the coral reefs that require sunlight and temperature conditions between 68 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit. These types of corals are formed by calcium carbonate, CaCO3, and they protect coastlines from erosion. In addition, they can actually help uh, coastlines from damage of hurricanes and tsunamis. Unfortunately, Corals are getting sick, corals are being damaged by humans, corals are being affected by climate change. A number of endangered and threatened species live there and they have very limited uh, time for recovery if we don't intervene as humans. So first we're gonna learn about the different types of corals. Then we're gonna go into some environments that you might find corals in. Then we're gonna talk about some coral health. The first type of coral reef is a fringing reef. So you can see here you've got some on the fringes or edges of a mountain or a volcano. You have corals right in this area. Those would be called fringing reefs. They're very distinctive. Typically sometimes they make rows. They're very much along the edge of a shoreline. Barrier reefs are a little different. Barrier reefs form offshore, distinctively making a barrier to the island or the shoreline. I mean, when you think of the Great Barrier Reef, you th that's not just a barrier reef. That's one of all different kinds of reefs, but it's probably the most famous because it grows in such a large concentration around a region that uh, people think of it as one solid reef when it's actually uh, almost 2,000 reefs in one. An atoll is where you get a volcanic area or an, a submerged island in which corals have grown up on top of it and it's made a round shape like you see right here. This is an atoll right here. So corals, uh, corals that grow on top of an ancient seamount uh, would represent an atoll. Probably the most famous one in our hemisphere is um, Midway. And Midway is exactly halfway between the Hawaiian Islands and the last seamount that is at the Aleutian Trench, that's subsurface. It's also the last one of the Emperor Seamount that is above water. So it won't take long before that particular atoll is eroded down and becomes a guyote. This is a patch reef, and a patch reef is distinctive in the fact that they're little bitty patches of reef growing just randomly on the water. So I took this on a helicopter tour above the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and these are the patches. As we flew over the section of the Great Barrier Reef that our tour was on, like we had to take a boat ride out for several hours, like two and a half, three hours from the mainland and sit in uh, Cairns, uh, Australia. It looks like Cairns, by the way, on the map, but it's called Cairns. And uh, once we got there, we had all day out to play on the water, and one of the things I opted to do was take a helicopter ride over the Great Barrier Reef. At the end of our lesson today, I'll include just a little video footage for fun to show you what it looked like from the air, because you really cannot get the gist of the Great Barrier Reef until you see it from the sky. Now, coral reefs require specific things in order to grow. They need the right temperature, they need a certain amount of salinity, 
Higher salinity produces different corals. Lower salinity can allow for diff uh, even different types of corals to grow. It must have water circulation. It must have oxygen, nutrients, stability for the corals to grow on, and immersion, meaning below water. This is a great uh, fringing reef right here. Do you see the ch sand channels and the reefs that have grown in this area? This would be a mooring where you'd tie your old boat off and then go diving and come under here and look at this. And I've spent time on this very reef. That's where this, these pictures came from. And I can tell you that uh, it's pretty a remarkable experience to be able to look at uh, coral reefs and watch them grow. A couple of things you might see where coral reefs are, are some features that starting from the shoreline working your way out to the last place you'll see a coral. Lagoonal grasses it actually exists. So if you ever hear grasses don't grow in the ocean, that's not true. There's special types of uh, saline tolerant grasses that are important for a number of species. Um, I can think of several right off the bat that would be manatees and some of their similar animals require to have these particular types of grasses. This shot right here came from um, uh, Monkey Maya in far western Australia where some of the most uh, dudong species which look kind of like manatees exist and this is the best place I've ever seen seagrasses in my life. Sand plains are very common in areas where uh, carbonate sands have started to build up. This is actually in the Bahamas right here. So you will see probably not as many corals here, but you can see patchy corals and sand plains. Lagoonal corals are probably my personal favorite because you can get some very nice branching corals. And here's why. Uh, the atmosphere or pressure of water basically goes for every 32-ish, 33 feet. And so beyond that, many branching corals like this elkhorn right here just don't have the stability to with, withstand the pressure of water. So they'll, they'll crush. So there's, usually if it's below that depth, let's say in the 40-foot uh, depth, you'll see smaller branching corals. So the big branching corals like elkhorn require shallow marine environments. And we're, I mean, very shallow. We're looking at, you know, 20 feet of water in most cases or less. Reef crests are areas where the reefs can actually come to the surface and actually block water and water waves will hit it. This is actually in Jamaica right here. And you're seeing a reef crest coming in through this area right there. Sand channels, this one's out of Jamaica as well. These are the things that exist between the fringing reefs I showed you a few pictures back. And sand channels are important for the circulation of water and nutrients for coral reefs. Four reef terraces, this is going to be a little bit deeper in the water. This is where I was saying you could form a different type of branching coral. This is staghorn coral. And these types of corals can withstand a little bit more pressure and many times they'll cover uh, the terraces of these four reefs before you start getting into the four reef slope. As you get into the four reef escarpment, this is the kind of corals you'll see. I took this shot in the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. And by the way, the color of corals, don't be deceived, most corals really have this kind of icky color right here. Really colorful corals uh, tend to have more pigmentation because of higher salt con uh, conditions from the experience I've had with diving. Um, not always true, and many times some of the brightest things you see in a coral reef are actually sponges, not corals. So in this particular case, this was a very healthy coral reef that we visited on the Great Barrier Reef. However, when we got to the slope, this is what it looked like. I was actually in a glass bottom uh, little submarine to take this picture. We were going down in uh, down the water profile, and I could take it out the window, and you can begin to see the corals kind of change their character. They're not as branchy, they're not as plentiful, they're growing on a slope that looks like this. Subsequently, the pressure is higher and different corals can grow. Keep in mind all corals that are photosynthetic uh, type of corals need sunlight, so you can't get beyond a certain depth and expect that those corals are going to grow for any uh, substantial length of time. Deep platy corals can grow in depths of 100 or more feet because they can withstand the pressure. They're built that way. They're built for deep pressure water conditions. You wouldn't find as many of these in shallow water as you would something like the staghorn and elkhorn corals that I showed you earlier. 
Now, destruction of coral reefs is, is very real, and it's a sad thing. Some of it's very natural, some of it's human-induced. Let's talk about the natural things at first. Hurricanes are devastating to coral reefs. However, it's a natural cycle to kind of clean out the corals, the rubble, and allows for new coral to grow on top of the old. Tsunamis can wipe an entire coral reef out with one major tsunami event, kind of like what happened to Japan and Sumatra. Unfortunately, the man-induced problems for corals outnumber the natural causes in most cases. So I'm just going to point the finger at us and say that that can be bad diving habits, that can be pollution uh, in the form of what do people do with their waste, and that may be industry, that could be commercial operations, that could be tourism, polluted runoff, it's a big one because corals can't get smothered or else they don't photosynthesize very well. Taking away corals for man-induced purposes, whether it be uh, pharmaceutical, whether it be for tourism, a number of different reasons this could happen. So we're going to look at a couple of places that I think that you should be very aware of that are important for protecting our, uh, our coral reefs from pollution, and in particular... Estuaries are where fresh water meets salt water, and, they're, and in there they become brackish. If you remember learning in an earlier lesson about salinity, you'll have uh, variable salinity levels in an estuary based on high and low tide conditions. But this is an essential place for water to get filtered before it gets out to the ocean where the corals may exist in areas that contain them. So this is a very unique sec section and oftentimes viewed as an a nuisance to uh, certain types of developers because the land is not very beautiful. You have to keep in mind, though, it is a breeding location. It's a waterfowl habitat. It's a fisheries habitat. It's a breeding ground. And the list just goes on. It is such an important element to leave estuaries where they are. So there's several different types of estuaries I want to focus on. Salt marshes are what we would have here in Texas. So if you went down to, let's say, Padre Island or Corpus Christi, they have salt marshes. However, if you get to a more tropical conditions, you could experience a mangrove swamps. This is what mangrove trees look like. Look at these funny root systems. Now, before you judge them for their ugly character, understand their beauty in terms of nature. I really shouldn't say they're ugly, but they're not beautiful trees. And oftentimes they're cut down for this very reason for big hotels, so forth, because of the way they look and that they tend to breed lots of mosquitoes. This is such an important element for the same reason an estuary provides to more of the, the land side. This provides it to the ocean side. Mangrove swamps. If we erase those, we erase one of the pivotal, important places where the ecology of a coral reef system can survive. And unfortunately, that they're being decimated around the planet. We want to protect our mangrove swamps. So if you ever see trees like this, realize that you're in a mangrove area if you're in a tropical location. These can actually anchor in sediment. They can, uh, at high tide, can provide... Uh, habitat, food resources, birthing grounds, you name it for all these different animals, but they are definitely an erosion protector of coastlines. When we talk about coral reefs, oftentimes people are very interested, how do they get damaged? Why are they healthy? Why are they not? So I want to kind of have you analyze these pictures. I want you to look at all three similar areas in the Caribbean and tell me which one is the healthiest one of the bunch. And you're gonna be thinking about that for a second. I bet you chose the upper left, right? This one. So some of the clues might be all the fish, the, uh, the nice clear water, the diversity of coral reef organisms. You come over here, all the staghorn coral is white. What's up with that? It's been bleached. So that's a, that's a type of illness for a coral. And, and so what that means is the pigmentation, the algae that makes up this live part of it, if the coral is dead. And so these will now become rubble and break off and they don't provide the habitat because the fish actually eat the, the algae. It's a symbiotic type of relationship. Here you see the turbid waters. That should be a clue as to maybe some of the reasons some of this is bleached out. So uh, this is actually the natural color of the coral right here. And when you start to see patchiness like this where the white 
it's going to end up like this one right here. Additional coral reef diseases. Here's a very healthy brain coral. If you wondered why it called the brain coral, because it looks like one. You can see how that is. Very, very healthy. Here's one that's not so healthy. It has black banding disease right in this section right here. So uh, these things can be attributed sometimes to human-induced pollution, sometimes not. Nevertheless, it's killing off corals at an unprecedented rate, especially in the Caribbean. So food for thought about our coral reefs and how important they are to us. And if you've never seen one, the next time you're in an area to go, you should take some time at least to snorkel and to investigate what that looks like. This is a shot of the Great Barrier Reef from a helicopter, and I'll be showing you some videos shortly of what that looks like. Have a great day. Bye.